we are at Lakshmi's Leadership Lounge session. And uh, this is all about future of work. You know, it's changing and now more than ever, it's time for us to evaluate the way we are leading, the way we are preparing ourselves. Uh, so in this series, we bring you a plethora of leaders who have inspired us by redefining the way they think. So join me, Lakshmi Prathuri, on this journey as I take a deep dive into the lives of trailblazers and their unique take on leadership. So today I want to invite, um, in a minute you'll see her, uh, I want to invite May, uh, May Thomas and she's a presenter, podcast producer, journalist, entrepreneur, voiceover artist, uh, and many more things, more than anything, one of the most exuberant, enthusiastic people I met. And uh, she's a pioneer in this industry, and she has uh, five years in podcasting space. Um, and also, uh, she started her career uh, in news, uh, as a news editor journalist uh, for community radio stations in UK. And then now she's come back to India in 2010 and, and she continued working in radio for a while. And then she moved into podcasting. And uh, I really want to acknowledge that podcasting has become a really uh, strong um, subject in India. And she's one of the pioneers in making this happen by bringing some really interesting people into, into it. And I would invite her and then have her talk about her experience a little bit uh, instead of me giving a longer bio than this because I want you to hear more from her and not from me. May, please welcome. So good to have you. Hi. Uh, hi, hi. So um, uh, I was, as I was uh, talking about May, you worked in the radio station, radio a lot before. So tell me a little bit about your experience with radio. What all, what all have you done with radio? Actually, I started out, I mean, I think my relationship with radio has been since I was a, a little girl. So I grew up, I was one of those kids with the tape deck. And then, you know, I used to record songs on blank cassettes off the radio. So my whole life, I've had this connection with radio. And I knew that I wanted to be in the media. And when I was in college, during that time, I realized that radio for me was just a medium in which I just felt a kinship with. And I started my career, as you'd mentioned, um, as a journalist and uh, a news editor for a community radio station. And this was in Wales. And it's crazy because we helmed, like uh, I and this Scottish guy, can you believe an Indian woman and a Scottish guy were in charge of uh, news for a community radio station in a place called Newport in Wales. And it was incredible. Like it was really exciting for us. And uh, I felt like there were things that we were covering that weren't being covered before. I had a chance to, you know, meet um, political leaders and the, you know, from the Welsh assembly and be able to get sent to do certain kinds of stories and really do investigative stuff that for me was great, but it was, a difficult time because that I pretty much graduated when the recession happened. So um, it was hard. And there was a point in time where the conservative government won in the UK. And I was like, I think I'm going back to India now. <laughs> My time here is done. <laughs> so I came back to India, but I continued to want to pursue being in radio. Mm -hmm. The only thing was that private commercial FM stations in India don't cover news. So as a journalist, I would have to either join AIR, you know, to be able to do news in India. So I did continue my stint in radio, but I was more on the sort of either I was hosting or on the, you know, I was a creative manager for a station in Chennai and then moved back to Bombay and I was working there as well. I was working at Radio One and yeah, and that was like the things that I learned from radio is that it's a medium that for me gives me a real buzz. Like it's so easy to go live. You just push up a fader and then like the world can hear you. And it's exciting for me because I really enjoyed that medium and I enjoyed the live. I enjoyed the buzz. It was great. I still miss it as a as because of the the the, the quickness and broadcast is always going to be super different um 
from, I guess, on demand. But yeah, I think that's, I, I still have a real kinship uh, with radio. Yeah. So let me ask you about a couple of things. One is to go from a radio journalist to a podcast creator. Actually, I mean, you're a podcaster yourself, but you're creating a platform. Uh, it, it's it's same yet very different, right? So one is tell me a little bit about what you need to do to upskill yourself. And secondly, tell me a little bit about what was the cultural shift of moving from UK to India for you? I mean, was there, uh, did you face any difficulty or was it easy to get back in? So, okay, let me answer the UK to India question and then the radio to podcast question, if that's okay. So firstly, from coming back from the UK to India, because I pretty much, uh, I learned this term uh, only a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called being a third culture kid. Uh, it means that you grew up in a culture that isn't the one that you're from. So I, like many Malayalis, I uh, grew up part of my life in the Middle East. So I, you know, I think I, I, I think I must have been like six or seven years old when uh, my parents, like we moved to the Middle East, I lived in Qatar. And then I came back to India and I was in boarding school in India. And then again, I, you know, at the age of 18, I was in the UK for six years. So I think this moving back and forth in and out of India has always been something that I've been sort of used to. And I guess you'd call it, I don't think, I think one of the things I've realized about myself is that I am not any different than who I am regardless of where I am in the world. I think my personality, like I think one of my friends was like, you're such a chameleon, like no matter where you are, you're able to just, and she's like, you're the same person in the UK as you are here. So I've had a couple of like British friends come and visit me here. And they're like, how are you? The world here is so different from the world there. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know what it is, but I think I've never had, I know a lot of people who've lived in many different countries struggle with their sense of identity. I don't think I ever did. And I, I have to say that I'm very lucky because my mother is a third culture kid. So she grew up in Aden, now Yemen. And then she was in uh, Hong Kong for 10 years. So she really was someone that I, I you know, knew that she was a third culture kid, but didn't know what the term was. So I think I grew up with that influence in my life. So I never felt like I could, I would need to be any different than who I already was. So coming back to India, the real change for me maybe was a bit of the work culture. I think maybe I was a little bit spoiled in the UK. I was so close to um, the station head and the people that I worked with. And not that I didn't have that in India, but I felt there was such a top down effect of like authority. And I also there, I don't know, like I always felt like I lack the ability to have the freedom that I wanted to, especially in corporate structures and working in a community radio station. It's like, everyone is so there's a blurry line between like hierarchy. So for me in India, the hierarchy was very stringent. And to be able to speak your mind in those structures was really hard. And I very much am someone who is creative. I like to put things out there. I like to discuss. I like cooperation. Um, but I felt like, like I said, I felt that kind of lacked in some of the corporate structures here when I, when I moved here. So that was like my big UK to India shift. Um, <laughs> the radio to podcasting question, right? So for, yeah. for that shift, actually it's the one thing that was the, the big change was that on radio, you have no time to think, you know, like you're doing an interview, you're alive, there is nothing, you know, you can't make any mistakes, you have to be. And if you do, it's fine, continue on. But the speed at which, so if I did an interview in the morning and it's going live in the afternoon, I'm editing that, putting that together and <clears throat> it's going out on air. So it's so sharp and precise and fast. So the speed of radio was very different. Like when I'm doing a podcast, I was like, wow, I have time. This is so exciting. <laughs> I suddenly had 
time to edit an interview. I had time to put something together. I had time to, and so with, with podcasting, the, my whole sort of viewpoint of what I could do in the audio medium changed. It was like the world was my oyster. I could, you know, create gorgeous sound design, you know, scapes. I could um, come up with new ways to sort of, you know, create things within the audio landscape that I just couldn't do on the radio. So I think that's something that live and, you know, um, on demand is so very different in which in ways they both have their strengths, but they also both have their weaknesses. And I think getting into podcasting was exciting for me because I was like, oh my God, there's so many things I can do. Where do I begin? Yeah. So let, so let me talk about where you began. Uh, you, you launched Made in India and created a huge big impact with it. So tell me a little bit about what was the creation, uh, creative expression uh, you were seeking with, f- with that? And uh, what was your experience with that? Or what is your experience with that? Um, so when I first, uh, like I I'd, I'd quit radio because I was quite jaded um, and I got approached to make a podcast and I had, you know, what, what could I do? And at that time, I because I knew so many independent musicians from not just working on the radio, but I was working for uh, um, an online publication called NH7.in. And I felt like I couldn't believe that some of the most incredible music that was coming out of this country wasn't getting airplay or at least airplay at peak time hours on the radio. So I wanted to be able to create a space where I get artists and independent musicians could tell their story that you could hear the music that they're making. So doing these live in-studio sessions was something that was a big part of what I wanted to do, which I couldn't do on the radio, but I could do in a fancy studio. So that was how Made in India sort of began. And then I was working within the podcasting space. I was a creative director for a podcast company. And that was exciting because we're building like this network. But when I sort of went you know, solo and independent uh, a couple of years ago. Initially, I was only thinking about keeping my own show alive. And then that's how um, I ended up, you know, people asking me uh, to make a podcast. And the first person is an ink fellow, Pooja Dingra. She was, she WhatsApp me and she was like, you are making my podcast. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and then we started working together and we still are. And it's exciting for me because you know, we're doing season two is coming out right now. And uh, No Sugar Coat was like the beginning of me having like, actually on my own, having started like my own sort of initiative. And in that space, I think what was really important for me was be able to work with interesting people, make shows that I felt like had real impact. And yeah, I think like starting my own company, I, I didn't have this like massive vision that I wanted a factory turn out podcasts. I think what was really important for me is because of the person that I am, I'm so deeply invested in the work that I do that creatively, I always felt like, okay, I'm going to do a few projects, but I want to make sure that they're really good and I'm really proud of them because there's only so much I can do as like one person. And I didn't want to have to like, allow that creativity or the the ideas or the quality of what we're doing to be lost. So that was something that was a very important part of like what I wanted to build within the podcast space. So one of the things about in, uh, you know, I'm now moving a little bit into general things in India. Uh, there are many reports, there are articles about how we have a shortage of leadership in India, leadership skills in India. Um, what's been your experience, you know, uh, and when I say leader, it doesn't mean somebody who's running a multi-billion dollar company or whatever, you're a leader, you're running a company, you're surrounded by people um, who are running companies, etc., and you've worked in various companies. What do you feel um, is a leadership skill that needs to be improved in India? Well, I think one of the things that I don't see in leadership, and I think it's something that I value a lot, is that I think as a leader, one of the most important skills you have to have 
is to listen. And I don't think enough leaders listen because I don't think as a leader, firstly, you don't know everything and you can't be expected to know everything. And I think one of the most important things about leadership is to know when you lack knowledge or perspective or context and having people around you, even if they're younger than you or less experienced than you, that doesn't mean that they don't have a new perspective or a different way of looking something or you know, ideas that you may have never thought of. So I think one of the most important skills that I think needs to be inculcated in some way or the other within leadership is listening. Uh, I couldn't agree you more. I agree with you more. Uh, tell me a little bit about who are the leaders you really admire. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't, this is going to be a really odd thing because like I'm not very good with authority. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like people way, telling you know? me what I cannot do. Um, but I think the, if I just had to look back on like the most basic level, um, just to look back at uh, bosses I used to have, just on that most basic level, I think one of the bosses that till date I still admire and then I still I'm still, you know, we're still friends and we still like talk to each other. Someone I used to work at any time, he and I were the same age. He was like a year older than me. But the thing that I loved about him and I thought was amazing was that I never felt lesser than. I never felt like there was a hierarchy. And again, because maybe the age gap between us was so small, but he was still my boss. I never ever felt like he wasn't an authority in the organization. But he was so open to ideas. He was always like, okay, guys, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do tomorrow? It was so exciting to work with him. And I wish I had the chance to work with him longer because he's the boss I worked with the least amount of time with. But definitely him and like my old station manager uh, when I was in the UK, Ian Lambsdale was his name. And then my old boss from NA7.in was Arjun S. Ravi. I should name them because they were, again, so open, so, so amiable, so easy to get on with, you know, you never felt like he wasn't someone that you couldn't talk to. As a leader, I think to have that, you should have that room that anyone can come up to you and talk to you about whatever is going on, whether it's something personal or whether it's something professional. And I think the two of them were really key as just bosses that I really thought were awesome. <laughs> Now, saying in the old system, in the industrial uh, evolution or whatever till now, we always felt a boss was someone who needed to know everything. And a boss felt they needed to say everything to the others and the others are supposed to implement it. But mm -hmm. I think the kind of bosses you're talking about, etc., are about, I don't know everything. Tell me what you think we should do and let's go play with it. Let's figure it out. I think uh, when they can admit that they have something to learn also instead of having the burden of always having to know the answers, I think a lot of possibilities open up. So that's really, really good what you said in terms of- Oh my of, God. You know, Absolutely. who are open to, open to it and open to collaborating and it's just a, we are all in it together kind of a thing, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I- I remember like this happened very like last year, 2020, is such a difficult time. And I, you know, you're just like, what am I going to do? And I remember the first thing I actually did was that um, someone who used to handle my audio engineer who like heads our sound now, uh, I said, you know what, we're not going to be able to go back into a studio anymore. We have to find the best solution to be able to record audio online, whether it's quality, whether it's like troubleshooting internet connections, what is the best one? So I just, instead of me doing the exploration and me figuring out what it was, I set him the task to do it. And then he came back and like, I'm able to make a decision because I've asked for the expertise from someone who actually understands who's an, I'm not an audio engineer and I run an audio company, but I yeah. do have audio engineers who work with me, who help me make decisions. 
So yeah. I I come from an audio background, but I don't have an audio engineering degree. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and yeah. you know. Yeah, and I think it's not about having all the expertise yourself, as you're saying. It's about so, surrounding yeah. yourself with people who can compliment you and letting them do their job and getting out of the way. Yeah. And right. That's, yeah, so, getting out of the way. That's so. <laughs> <laughs> so you know and um another question i have for you is that um is there a particular story or a quote or an experience you had that really defines the way you want to be a leader oh oh my god that's like such a tough one i think um so i'll tell you something that i think happened to me personally um and i think that sort of has influenced maybe an aspect of what i saw as leadership and valuing people i told you about arjun as ravi the very sweet editor of nh7.in who was my um who was my boss he so when i when i quit i it was like i dropped a bomb and this blew it up <laughs> in his world cuz i was his right hand person i was the sub editor of any seven dot in and so it was i think a huge shock for him at that time and you know we'd worked so closely with each other and i left because i i i wanted to go back into radio and i really missed it and i got an opportunity and i took it and i decided that you know i had to leave and to tell him was really hard because i loved working with him and i remember at the editorial meeting that we had he was like me is going to be leaving blah 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 and then uh within n87.in there were two people there was arjun who helmed the content because it was a website and there was a guy called shreya shrinivasan who helmed the sort of tech and the back end stuff mm-hmm. and shreya and i were close to and he found out that i was leaving and the first thing he said to me is like you wait tomorrow lunch i'm calling arjun and i was like what is this about yeah. and he sat there and said that i cannot let you go you cannot leave this organization what do you want to do what is it that you want to do you want to start a radio station i'll build the i'll build the studio here on me in this office i'll do this i'll do and it amazed me like even though i had worked with arjun so closely he didn't want to stop me from doing what i wanted to do and what i felt like was great for me and then i had this completely other person who again was a boss within the company and he had the complete opposite he was like i cannot let you go because i value you mm-hmm. and i'm going to try to fight to keep you on to you know match the salary and you want to do radio we'll do that whatever it is we will make it happen i mean of course i still left but yeah i realized that like one thing was that i had one boss who was valuing me and my dreams and wasn't stopping me from doing what i wanted to do and then i had this other person who valued me so much he didn't want to let me go yeah. and so it's amazing and for me i learned that i always think that valuing the people that you have is so important and you can do it in so many different ways and some of them are small and some of them are big and i always think that the moment you value people people will stick around with you for longer people will yeah. want to continue to work for you despite everything that's happening in the world and i was very lucky that i had that you know i've had um someone who was working with me who wanted to do a stint to the BBC like an internship for a month so i was like okay go do it and she still did it and came back and i i think that when opportunities come your way and you have the ability to give people a chance to do what they want to do i think that's so important like mm-hmm. i think i mean i know this sounds so basic but we pay people on time yeah that's people value that people value yeah. not having to chase for payments that are owed to them it's one right. of the most uh, horrible things to have to do i went through it when i was freelancing so yeah, yeah so i think um 
yeah the thing that i feel like is so important is like yeah. these kind of i don't know if i've answered your question but i've tried no i think you know so it's sort of i i understand that some of the experiences you go through maybe will decide how you will handle and i can understand yeah. from your boss's point of view when when you invest in someone for so long and they are yeah. getting up they to speak only when they say they leave i think the only thing i would say is that are you leaving with enough people behind who can take on what you were doing or are you really de- leaving a vacuum and i think one of the best lessons i learned is that to train the people in such a way that you're not needed i mean that allows you to go do something else so uh, okay. i i mean that's the only thing i would add to that so we are actually at that stage where we are role reversing so you can ask me questions so this is a session called so, stop me if you can so ask away like me lakshmi this is my job <laughs> i ask all the yes. questions all the time <laughs> you're just giving the mic back to the person who has the mic all the time but then you so, have very little time to do that for a change we are featuring you you are this yeah. but we need to know who you are so <laughs> lakshmi is like i'm taking the mic now <laughs> my turn um no so i i do have a couple of questions to ask you um so yeah. one of them and i think this is really important because i've done this in the past and very in the very very recently was that have you ever walked away from a potentially lucrative project because it went against your fundamental ideals mhm um you know i mean i have walked away from things or uh, me and the other partners have agreed to mutually walk away from things but i mean for me it has never been about uh something print simply wrong i mean i've been asked these questions that you know a cigarette company comes and tells you i'll give you a million dollars will you take it you know when i was doing my non profit i was i used to raise money for charities etc mm-hmm. and you know there is no right answer at one point i would say yeah of course i'll take it you know and but if they are asking me to market cigarettes i won't do it mm-hmm. but if the money is coming for me to do whatever i want to do with it and i can buy 500 uh you know tablets to give to kids so they can all be connected to the web of course i'm going to do it so i you know it all depends on the situation etc yeah. but i will say one thing is that i have walked away from situations where i felt that the premise with which we started of exciting to work together and you know we are in this partners etc and then there are differences of opinions where you feel you're not seeing eye to eye anymore it's not because you know it's fundamentally you're different principally you're different or whatever at some point if you feel that hey you know the respect for each other's word is somehow not carrying through uh, and we are not able to get past a certain difference of opinion or something it's best to let the other person take the ownership and let it be theirs and walk away uh, instead of fighting for it a lot of times you know so some things are worth fighting some things are not worth fighting figure out which one is what and that is the uh, thing i always look at is it's not just knowing what you want it's also knowing what you don't want it's not just going after what you want it's also knowing when to say this is not just worth going after so i think having that balance is very important and there have been times uh it could have been very lucrative uh but i felt that principally we are not aligned so even if we agree to do it i may be working in an environment where we won't see eye to eye then it's just not fun no yeah. it does it it is those moments that i couldn't agree with you more where you are going to be not battling with the people that you work with but battling with yourself right you yeah like what you're doing and in in a lot of times there isn't even a, a logical answer to it it's just that whatever the premise with which you started somehow has changed and you have to make a very painful decision uh to uh to go one way or the other yeah. and uh, but you have to make the decision and take the responsibility and never look back and say 
I wish we did this, I wish we did that or whatever. Um, I always have respect for people from whom I walked away also because there's a reason why we started together because we are excited about it. So I think I always say that it doesn't matter. Someday something will come along and we'll work together again. But mm -hmm. for now, this is yours and go for it. So it's, it's not easy, but you have to do it. Everybody who ran businesses has to do it. <laughs> has to point. do it. That's yeah. so true. Um, yeah. So my yeah. second question to you um, mm. is based on something that happened to me very recently. So you know on Instagram how they have these like little things that ask you like a question at the top and you have to answer it. So like I got this one that said, what is your dream at the moment? And my answer was retirement. So mm. <laughs> I'm dreaming about retirement. I've aged 10 years. <laughs> 2020 <laughs> retirement is uh, my now my, my my passionate dream so i wanted to ask you uh because this is what's like in my brain right now what does retirement look like for you i don't know i mean i i can't think of retirement i mean just today we, we are on the road trip and we were talking earlier and i said i want to go like Abdul Kalam, you know, I'll be giving a talk on a stage someday and I just collapse, you know, <laughs> to me, retirement is like not breathing anymore. Uh, uh, or maybe it's, it'll, oh, I'll do exactly what I'm doing, maybe with a lot more money. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's what it is. Well, and, uh, um, oh my God. But I love, I love how you thought about your dramatic end. You're like, I'll be on stage giving a talk and then I drop dead. <laughs> that's like, wow, I'm that's not like that, you know, like, There'll be like people tweeting, Instagramming, saying, I was there when she breathed her last or something like that. And there'll be like, you know, like billions of people reading those. <laughs> and I'll become famous, you know, even in my death by the tweets and Instagrams. Oh my God. I'm like Watching crying, people. laughing right now. No, Actually, no. It's so funny. Probably. You know, I, I, I really don't know. I mean, that's the best scenario I can think of. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, that's genuinely, I did not expect that. Like, like I, my retirement. <laughs> yeah, I didn't is, expect yeah. that you asked me and I was like, well, okay, what would it be like? You know, it's sort of, I'm sure there are many people who hope I retire because, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's so mean. But I love that you think your retirement is death. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. It's like, fuck, she's gone, you know. Oh my God. So yeah, those are my, my, my two stump me questions. I <laughs> So anyway, I have, uh, you know, I want to say one thing that as we wrap this up, one of the ideas we always talk about is what we call ink tree seed idea, because what happens, we have amazing conversations with people and I don't want it to end right away. And there has to be a way in which we can continue afterwards. So one thing I wanted to ask you is that we would love to do something with you that you do anyway and in a way that it can benefit the ink community. So what do you think we can do together that you love to do anyway? So I am, I mean, as you can tell, a bit of a podcast evangelist. Yes. So I think- We can take the words a bit off from that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, I, uh, have come from the, you know, audio has been my entire career and it is a medium that is really close to my heart. And mm -hmm. I do think that podcasting in India is growing and has a lot of untapped potential. I also think it's a great way to, for people to build communities with, to be able to show off your expertise in the industry that you're from. I think that mm -hmm. you have the ability to be more sort of creatively bold and be a little more risky in like when you're doing different kinds of things in the audio medium than you would on say social media or on a video. And mm -hmm. I, I think what would be really interesting is to see in what ways the Inc. fellows um, would see podcasting as a potential for being mm -hmm. a mouthpiece for them or their company or their brand or themselves. Yeah. And so maybe this is a great idea. Maybe what we can do is arrange for you to, you know, give like a one hour masterclass or a talk about what is podcasting, what is important, how to find uh, the topic for podcast, etc. to our fellows and uh, see where it goes from there. Sounds good. 
yeah so may thank you so much uh, and uh, you are uh, you know i love the name of your show made in india with like a m a e d made yeah. in india and people, the number of people i say you spelt it wrong and i know like, that's my name <laughs> <laughs> grandfather gave it to me <laughs> very i know i know because it's sort of all the four letters of made are there but just like misplaced right sure. so yeah. <laughs> so if it was like m a y e d or something it would have been a little different but yeah. uh, but <laughs> right. uh, yeah. but anyway i just want to say really uh, i mean there's so much i have learned from uh, watching what you're doing and yes. uh, i really want to thank you and i think uh, i just want to summarize by saying that uh, you know leadership has many hues uh, etc and i think part of leadership is learning from people who are around you uh, who could be half your age and uh, twice as smart which both you are and oh uh, my god shy <laughs> is coming <laughs> <laughs> so i really want to thank you for that and uh, and and say that i think uh, the jump that you took from being a radio journalist to a podcaster and building a podcast platform is really great so thank you so much for your time and for Thanks all those like young listeners you know it's sort of here is another career for you so think about it and thank you so much for your time thanks lakshmi okay bye everyone <laughs>